the reactor lies a huge stretch aquifer that supplies the entire country with water. What worried us the most was that the entire mass would sink down and reach the groundwater, which then would pollute the rivers Pripyat, then Dnieper, Kiev, the Black Sea. We absolutely needed to come up with a solution. A new operation is considered, but it will entail the loss of more lives. On the 12th of May, 1986, 17 days after the initial explosion, the miners of Tula, 1,000 kilometers from Chernobyl, receive a visit from the Kremlin, from the deputy minister of the mining industry. The minister spoke to us about the accident at Chernobyl. He said they needed miners from our region, the Moscow Basin. He gave us 24 hours to gather our belongings. The next day, we were bussed from that very square to the airport in Moscow. On the 13th of May, our comrades were already at work at Chernobyl. Their mission, to approach the reactor through what is now the only possible path, underground. Our mission was this, dig a 150 meter tunnel from the third blurb to the fourth, a tunnel 30 meters long. Then dig a room 30 meters long and 30 meters wide to hold a refrigeration device for cooling down the reactor. To limit their exposure to radiation, the miners dig 12 meters down before making their way over to the burning reactor. There, they build a room 2 meters high and 30 meters wide where a complex cooling system of liquid nitrogen will be set up. In one month, 10,000 miners from Russia and the mining regions of the Ukraine are sent down into the tunnel. They're between 20 and 30 years old. Inside the tunnel, which has no ventilation, the temperature hits 50 degrees Celsius and radioactivity is at a minimum of one ronchen per hour. We worked without any protective gear. The miners couldn't use masks because the filters would get damp after a few minutes. So everyone just took them off and kept on working without them, with our shirts off too. We drank water out of open bottles, which was really bad because the radioactive particles were ingested right into our body. One of our comrades swallowed a grain of sand that was highly radioactive. He died. How can we know what each of us breathed or ingested? The hardest thing was the lack of oxygen and the incredible heat. It was hot, hot, hot. And we had to work really fast, at a crazy pace, faster and faster. That was the hardest. Go, go, go. Battalions of 30 miners relay each other every three hours, 24 hours a day. In one month and four days, they dig a 150-meter tunnel, a job that in a mine would have normally taken three months. The most dangerous places were not underground. There wasn't as much radiation below the reactor. But as soon as we came up, we had to run even faster. Radioactivity at the mouth of the tunnel is 300 times higher. Not a single miner is spared from exposure. Not once are they informed of the real dangers they are facing.
Someone had to go and do it. Us or someone else. We did our duty. Should we have done it? It's too late to judge. I don't regret anything. The miners accomplish their mission, but the cooling system is never set up below the reactor. The underground room is finally filled with cement to solidify the structure. The official position is that each miner received 30 to 60 rongens, but survivors claim they received up to five times that amount. It is estimated that a fourth of these men died before the age of 40. 2,500 lives lost that don't appear in any official statistic. While the miners are still digging below the reactor, Hans Blix, with Soviet authorities, organizes a press conference in Moscow. Let me say that on behalf of the IAEA, we have expressed profound regret at the tragic accident, the loss of lives, and the damage which has been caused. We have now agreed with the Soviet authorities to come to Vienna for a post-accident analysis. In front of 500 journalists from all over the world, he announces an international conference that will be held in Vienna, where the Soviets have agreed to share all their data on the disaster. To analyze the accident. The most important effect of the press conference was that the Russian people felt that we can believe these guys. Uh, they were used to having a government that uh, they didn't believe one word in, and uh, accidents and disasters were usually suppressed. They didn't inform about them. So what they'd heard about this was just kept them worried that it might be even worse. It was. It was bad enough, to be sure. But um, they felt that, yes, these guys we trust. So this was a victory for Glasnost. The Soviets agreed to cooperate fully with the West, an historic change that begins an era of openness which became known as Glasnost, a political victory for Gorbachev, who sorely needs it. Because in Chernobyl, although the fire is now being kept in check, the breach and tons of highly radioactive rubble lie exposed to the elements. It is of the utmost urgency to cover the broken structure and clean up the zone. But for that, more men will be needed, many more men. Eighteen days after the disaster, Gorbachev finally addresses the Soviet people. The entire country was mobilized. No bureaucratic formalities. If someone had what we needed, we took it. No formalities. We'd worry about the cost later. We took whatever we needed. It was a frontline situation. General Nikolai Tarakanov is sent to command the land troops. In one year, a hundred thousand soldiers and officers passed through Chernobyl. They were all reservists. They were summoned up by top administration in their cities and sent to the front. Military personnel or civilians often